Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about archaebacteria, or archaea. Basically, when we first discovered archaebacteria and separated that as its own domain, we thought they lived just in the harsh environments on our planet. So we discovered them in the hot pots of Yellowstone Park, we discovered them in the Great Salt Lake, we discovered them in swamps. And so we, we thought these, these archaea bacteria kind of lived on the edges of life, but we really hadn't looked everywhere. And once we started looking out here in the ocean, we used a method called PCR, and that's polymerase chain reaction. It's basically a way to take a little bit of genetic material, so a little stretch of DNA, and then make millions and millions and millions of copies of it, and so we could actually study it. And what we found is that when we started looking in the ocean, you know, almost 10% of all the life we were finding are archaea bacteria. And so archaea bacteria are everywhere. They're found in the gut of a cow, the gut of you. They're found everywhere. We just didn't really know what we were looking for. And so if we look on the phylogenetic tree of life, basically this is that first, right here we would say, that last universal common ancestor that all life on our planet has. Basically, we had a branch that in this direction that went to form the bacteria, the domain bacteria. Then we had another branch that broke off and formed both the eukaryotes, like you, and then the archaea bacteria. What does this mean? Basically, you're more related to an archaea bacteria than you are to a bacteria. But always remember that this, that there's horizontal gene transfer. In other words, there's like mitochondria that formed over here, and so there's probably quite a bit of this horizontal transfer back and forth, and so it's not as simple as that, but know that archaea bacteria share more in common with eukaryotes than they do with bacteria. What are some characteristics then of, uh, of archaea bacteria? Basically, they're prokaryotic, and that's a term that's lost meaning, but basically it means that they don't have a nucleus and they don't have organelles, so they're not going to have their DNA uh, separated in a nucleus, and they're not going to have things like mitochondria or Golgi apparatus. So they're basically going to just be a cell, and that cell is going to have its genetic material on the inside in, in like a nucleoid region. So they're going to be that. They're still going to have cytoplasm. They're still going to have ribosomes. They're still going to have a lipid bilayer around the outside. Now one thing that they also have that's similar to bacteria is that they're going to have a cell wall. So there's going to be a cell wall that goes around the outside of the archaea bacteria. Um, in bacteria, this is going to be made up of peptidoglycan, but in uh, archaea bacteria, it's not made of peptidoglycan. It's made of a simpler kind of a connecting uh, subunit. So we call that an S layer. Um, but the big difference between the two, big difference between eukarya and uh, archaea bacteria is going to be found in the membranes. And so remember, a membrane is made up of these things. They're called phospholipids. And so the phospholipids in your membrane are going to look just like this. They have a fatty acid hydrocarbon tail, and then they're going to have a glycerol head with a phosphate on the top. And so if you look at this one, this would be a phospholipid found in you or in bacteria. If we look at the ones found in archaea bacteria, well, there's a few things that are going to jump out. First thing that's going to jump out is they're the mirror image. In other words, it's right hand meets left handed. And so the glycerol head is going to be pointed in the other direction. Uh, we're also going to have right here where it connects to the fatty acid tail. In us, we're going to have what's called an, uh, an ester linkage. So that's going to be right here. But in, in archaea bacteria, they're going to have an ether linkage. And then the other thing that they're going to have is these branched hydrocarbons. So those hydrocarbons are actually going to have little branches that come off the side. And sometimes they'll actually form, instead of a bilayer like we have right here, they'll actually form a monolayer. And sometimes there'll actually be chains or rings that form there. And so you might be thinking, well, why is that? Why is their membrane so different? Well, a lot of archaea bacteria, remember, can live in these harsh environments. And if you have a monolayer or if you have a more cleps complex hydrocarbon tail, you can deal with bigger temperatures, higher temperatures, and also bigger fluctuation, fluctuations in pH. And so those are some of the characteristics of RK bacteria. How do they make a living? In other words, what do they use for metabolism? Well, basically, just like bacteria, they're going to have a lot of ways to make a living. Some are phototrophs. That means they use energy of the sun. An example would be a halobacterium. Halobacterium are a type of archaea bacteria that live in really high concentrations of salt. In fact, their proteins don't even work unless the concentrations of salt are really, really high. Um, but what they're using is energy of the sun. They're using energy of light to do uh, something similar to photosynthesis. Um, they'll use a different, instead of chlorophyll, they're going to use a different pigment to pick up that energy, but it's similar. 
There are also things that are called lithotrophs. Those are actually breaking down, or uh, not organic, but breaking down just simple chemicals uh, to get energy. An example would be a methanogen. Uh, if you break down that word, they're generators of methane gas. If you're looking for a great place to uh, find methanogens, it'd be in the gut, like the gut of a cow. What they're doing is they're breaking down uh, carbon dioxide that's produced through cellular respiration, and then they're producing methane gas from it, and they're making a living out of that. So they're actually using chemicals, not feeding on life. And then we're going to have organotrophs. Those are going to be similar to us. They're breaking down organic material. An example would be sulfolobus. Those would be found like in uh, hot, pot, hot pots, for example, of Yellowstone Park. Some of them can actually break down sulfur and add oxygen to it to make energy, but sometimes they're breaking down organic materials. And so uh, we would point to these ones up here, phototrophs being those similar to plants that we have, and these being similar to animals. But again, there's quite a bit of different variety. Uh, how do they reproduce? Well, there's going to be no mitosis, no meiosis. They reproduce just like bacteria. So basically, they'll take their chromosome, and, and I should have pointed this out. This is another difference between us and archaea. Instead of having chromosomes that are linear, they're going to be in a loop. But basically, when they want to reproduce, they're simply going to copy their genetic material, and then they're going to split in half. And so we call that binary fission. Each of these are going to be identical to that original cell. But remember, just like in bacteria, they have what are called plasmids, little bits of extra DNA, and they can exchange those with other archaea bacteria. And they can get mutations, and so they can get quite a bit of genetic variability. But they live everywhere on our planet. So for example, a termite is able to eat wood because they're going to have some archaea bacteria inside their gut that can help them break down that cellulose. They're also going to be really important inside the rumen of a cow to help them digest food. But we also use it in like breakdown of sewer or sewage cleanup, or we build um, biogas using uh, RK bacteria. And so basically, RK bacteria, they're prokaryotes, single cell critters. Uh, they look a lot like bacteria, but they're actually more related to us. They live in harsh environments, but they also live everywhere else. And I hope that's helpful.